we're so grateful and thankful to be able to come to your living room, your tablet, your cell phone, and present to you again uh, this Lord's Day morning a message that we believe will help us continue to navigate our way during this critical time. I come today with a another message related to the times in which we are living. And uh, I'm calling this what to do in times like these. I'm sure that we are all aware that we are to never forget what our national, state, and local leaders has admonished us, and I come today to agree with them, to encourage and remind us that during these times, let's make sure that we continue to be faithful in washing our hands often. Let's make sure that we sanitize needed areas often. Let's make sure that we apply social distances every day of our lives. And let's make sure that we adhere to the city of Little Rock's curfew requirements. As responsible citizens, we must obey the laws of the land. However, today I want to share with us from the word of God a few more things we should do in times like these. I want to call your attention to the book of Hebrew, reading from the New King James Version, verse 19 through 23. And it reads like this, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated, for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God here are the three things I want to talk about verse 22 says let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. What to do in times like these? One of the things I want to recommend of the three is the first thing we want to talk about is we should draw near to God. In the book of James, chapter 4, verse 8, James says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. In Psalm 73, verses 27 and 28, it reads like this. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. There is time now for us especially those of the household of faith. But I also want to appeal to those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. The key to going through any rough times in life is to make sure that we are close to the Lord. Drawing near will always involve prayer. If we're going to draw near to God, we're going to have to be people that would bow our knee before him. Prayer 
is something that we don't do sporadically. The Apostle Paul said, pray in season and out of season. So when the evil days come, you'll be able to stand. The right of Hebrew is picturing an Old Testament priesthood tabernacle. And one of the things that was always uh, instructed by God to the priest is they were to come into the tabernacle, come through the outer court to the inner court, and then eventually go into the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies is where God lived. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was located. And now the rite of Hebrew, with that background in mind, instructed the believers and the audience, which was mostly Jewish audience, is now based on the fact that God has accepted one sacrifice, that is his son, that Jesus Christ now is the ultimate sacrifice. There is no need for animal sacrifice anymore. The last sacrifice for sin has been offered on Calvary cross. And the writer says, now based on what Jesus Christ has already done on Calvary, he has been our God's sufficient sacrifice. He's offered his life. He shed his blood. And now based on what God has accepted, based on what Christ has already done, the right of Hebrews said, now let's draw near. When we look at the fact that Jesus Christ came, hung, bled, died, that we might have the right to the tree of life, I want us to be reminded today and continually be reminded that based on what God has done for us through Christ, it is imperative now that we draw near to him. It is a it's in time like these that we should not get far away from him. It's in time like these when people ought to cling as close to him as we possibly can get. And that begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That begins every day by starting our day with prayer. That begins by reading God's word. That begins by finding time throughout the day to meditate on his word. That begins by finding quiet time that we can spend alone with him. Paul, uh, the writer gives three things. I said Paul because I believe Paul is the writer of Hebrew, but we're not going to argue that this morning. Uh, we just believe he wrote it. And he gives three things here. He said, number one, uh, draw near with a true heart. Draw near with a sincere heart. Draw near with a true heart. Other words, he's saying, be genuine. Be sincere. And do it without ulterior motive. The Bible helps us to understand that God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. So whenever we're going to come near to God, the first thing we got to look at is our motive. Is our heart right? When we come to God, we draw near to him. Are we doing that with sincerity? Are we doing it with genuineness? Are we faking it until we can make it? It is important that we as children of God, as people of God, as those who want a relationship with God, it is always important that when we come to him, that we come with a sincere heart. I'm so glad that God is able to see my heart. I'm so glad that God is not one that's looking at just our outward appearance. I'm so glad that he looks deep inside of me, deep inside of you. And we don't have to have a lot of money. We don't have to have a big status in life to draw near to him. But we got to have a genuine heart. If our heart is right, I promise you on the word of God, if we get our heart right and we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. 
The second thing the writer said is we draw near with full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. Full assurance of faith simply means utter confidence in the word of God. Let me give you another definition. I know Hebrews 11 and 1 says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. But let me give you another definition. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. If you really want to believe and have faith, then we've got to believe that God is telling the truth. So he says, when you draw near, draw near with a sense of your heart, but also draw near with full assurance of faith. Faith is that which we cannot see. Faith is always in what God has said of what God has promised. So as we come and desire to have a closer walk with him, it must be by faith. It must be tied to the fact that God has given his son. His son has given his life. His son shed in his blood that our sins may be forgiven. And his son was buried and his son rose the third day morning with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. So none of us was there. None of us saw that. We all believe it because it's written in the word of God. So we're going to act like God is telling the truth that Jesus is alive. And we've got to approach God by faith. We've got to believe that he's listening. We've got to believe that he understands us. Also, we've got to believe that nothing gets by him. We've also got to believe that nothing happens in the world unless he allows it. We can't question why this, why that. But I want us to always know that God is all-knowing, God is all-seeing, and God is everywhere at the same time. The third thing he says in there, he says now, having our hearts sprinkled, from an evil conscience and our body is washed with pure water. We've got to, if we're going to draw near to God, we've got to allow him to cleanse us inside and out. We've got to know that our hearts got to be right. We mentioned that earlier. Our hearts got to be clean. And what he's saying to the Jewish audience of this day that you've got to make sure not only that your hands is washed in the labor, but your heart has been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. And now we want to remind us, the first John 1 and 9, I love that verse when I got full understanding to the best of my ability of what it means. First John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, if we will agree with God about our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sin and cleanse us from all unright. He will forgive us our sin, meaning he will clean us up on the inside and then he'll clean us from all righteousness. There are things I've done, you've done, that you're not even aware of. There are thoughts I've had and you've had that you're not even aware of, but God is aware. And when we agree with him about the sins we do know about, then the right of Hebrew, I mean the right of John, say he'll also cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The next thing he says is verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful let me read that one more time it, it, it's just so good let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering for he who promised is faithful let us hold fast the hope 
we profess. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us make sure that during these critical times, as we draw near, one of the things we also got to do as we draw near, we also got to hold fast. The writer is saying, hold fast to the hope we profess. What is the hope we profess? We profess a hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to hold on to that. We profess a hope that God is our Heavenly Father. And we've got to hold on to that. We cannot allow now rough times in life to cause us to waver in what we believe. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Without wavering, without swerving, without going like the wind tossed to and fro. We've got to stay a steady course during these critical times. And he says the reason we've got to hold fast our hope without wavering is because he who promised is faithful. I don't know, do we really understand that God can be trusted? I don't know that we understand that God, what he has said, he will do. He is one who has never went back on his word. He is one we can trust. And I like the scripture that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hold fast the profession of our hope. Another word means persevere. Persevere. Persevere is the evidence of our salvation. See, not quitting is something that we must always remember. Christians are not those who give up and quit. The reason we're able to persevere is because God has saved us, because the Holy Spirit lives in us. So when tough times come, we just rise up and put our trust in him because he is faithful. We can hold on. We will hold on because we are children of almighty God. And if you do not know him, if you're thinking about quitting, you're thinking about giving up, I offer, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Try him. If you never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I invite you to come and try him for yourself. and fall short of the glory of God. To become a Christian, a person must first realize that he or she is lost, totally estranged from God, separated from God by a sinful nature. Romans 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A person alone cannot reconcile themselves with the Holy God. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life God demanded. Romans 5 and 8. But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Although humanity through sin has separated itself from God, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross bridged that gap. Romans 10 and 9 That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
God asks that we repent of our sins, reject sinfulness and pride, but then accept the sacrifice Christ made on the cross for us. Romans 10 and 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God promises in the Bible that anyone who accepts Jesus as Lord shall be saved. The third one of what we should do in times like these is verse 24. And he says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So I entitled this one is we should move one another on toward love and good deeds. One of the things that we've got to never forget is we are our brother's keeper. We are supposed to be concerned about one another. He said, move one another along, stir up one another, get where we are encouraging one another. And the reason we are encouraging one another is we encourage them to go on toward love and good deeds. Love is an action word. Love is that that is done in order to show Christ in our life. Love is for the benefit of others. We are to love others because God first loved us. God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If God so loved us, brethren, we ought to love one another. You remember the greatest two commandments of all? Jesus said, number one, is to love thy God with all of thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And number two, is to love thy neighbor as thyself. All the other commandments hinges or hangs on these two. So we ought to stir one another up toward love. Let's make sure that during this, this crisis that we are not against one another, that we are with one another. Uh, I live in a cul-de-sac. And in the cul-de-sac last week, one of the neighbors uh, started a Texan that asked the question, how is everybody doing? Is everybody all right? And I responded immediately and, and, and shared with him that uh, our household, the Featherstones, are, are doing fine. And thank you for checking on us. That was so kind of you. And then everybody in the cul-de-sac, about 12 houses, everybody responded. And we're there on text reading what each other is saying. And everybody was grateful that he would check on us. And that same gentleman, his wife started texting the day that he went up north to pick his daughter up and filling up his gas tank at the service station, a person hit him in the parking lot, knocked him up on his car, and then took off. And she was texting the day and letting us know what happened, and he is doing all right. Just a little sore. And the whole cul-de-sac responded with gratefulness and thanksgiving to God and how good God is. But the point I'm trying to make is everybody was concerned about their neighbor because we are our brother's keeper. There's no room in Christianity for the long range of Christians. I liked long rangers growing up as a boy and long rangers was a good guy. He rode a white horse and wore a white hat and wore a white suit and 
He would always get the bad guy and ride off in the sunset with his partner Tonto. And it was the long range in Tonto solving the crime all by themselves. But I want to tell you, there is no room in Christianity for long ranges. We're in this thing together. We are part of the one another's. And we are to stir one another up toward love because we're in this together. And he says love and good deeds. Now good deeds refer to what we do. Uh, it is very critical that we as Christians understand that we ought to do good deeds. Let me read you what Apostle Paul said to the Galatian church. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Paul said, whatever you do, let us not stop doing good. Do, ne do not never get tired, grow weary of doing good. He said, because there's come a season when we will reap if we faint not, if we don't lose heart, if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, now listen at this. He said, therefore, based on the fact that we never give up in doing good, we just always continue to do good. He said, based on that, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. If we get up every day and look for an opportunity to do good. Look for an opportunity to help somebody. Look for an opportunity to encourage someone. And then I like this last sentence. He said, now let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. As we desire to do good to everybody, we got to especially make sure that we try to do good to the household of faith. What to do in times like these? Number one, draw near to God. Number two, hold fast to the confession of our hope. And number three, move one another toward love and good deeds. God bless you this day and always is our prayer. We are still aware of how many of you viewing must feel because we're not able to come inside and worship together. With that in mind, we want to remain prayerful. Let's make sure that we continue to do as much worship online as humanly possible. We want to thank you for being a YouTube viewer with us. We thank God for all that you do for us, the encouraging words. And if you would like to leave a comment, please post comments in our comment section. As we continue, move forward in this. Uh, let's ask the Lord for his help. Let's obey the word of God. Let's do all we can to stir one another along with love and good deeds. And we want to give you our YouTube channel once again. It's at Greater Second LR. Also, I want to continually encourage our members, not only our members, but members of other churches, uh, whatever we do now, we must remain faithful in our giving. I'm sure you know by now that God is our source. He is the one we depend on. And as we move forward, layoffs, some people will be losing their jobs. But let's not give up on obeying the Lord. Let's show him that we're going to be faithful in our tithes and offering. 
Let's continually support our local church. And whatever you do, don't stop giving. I would like to take this time to invite those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's real simple. All you got to do is be sincere. And you can do it now. You can say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I have not given my life to you, but I believe in you. I believe that your son died on Calvary. I believe that you buried him. I believe on the third day morning he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. And I believe he's coming back. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save my soul. And if you've done that and you meant it, the Lord will save you based on his word. Let me close with a prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of worshiping together by way of YouTube. We thank you for the Greater Second Baptist Church and this YouTube ministry now. We're asking that we would uh, trust you, we believe in you, and Lord, we just want to thank you for being our God and we being your people. And now we ask that the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit will rest, rule, and abide in each of us now, henceforth, and forever. Let us all say, Amen.